All right, so Genesis chapter number 24. Obviously, it's a really long chapter. I'm not going to go, normally I go through every single verse line by line when we do our Wednesday night study, but um, we're going to go over a lot of verses. But basically, as we've just finished reading the entire chapter, you can kind of see there's like a duplication in the story. First, we see Abraham's servant, and then he recounts everything that happened and all of the, the, the great events to Rebecca's family and tells them, you know, all of these things happen and it's, and it's by God's providence that I'm here. So I'm not going to go through every single one of those lines of kind of duplicating the story again, but we're going to go through the majority of it. I'm going to hit on the, on the, the main theme of this chapter definitely um, about, about, you know, Rebecca being chosen as a wife for Isaac because Abraham did not want any of the women of Canaan to become his wife. He did not want the heathen women to, to, be, to be married unto his son. It was an important thing for him that he would send his servant out to go and get someone that was of his kindred, someone that was going to be a righteous woman for, for his son to marry. Let's, um, we'll start off reading here again in verse number one. Well, it says, and Abram was old and well stricken in age. And remember, last, chat, last week we went over Sarah and she, how she had died. So Abraham now is, is alone, I mean, with his, with his son, of course, and with his whole great household and his servants and everything else. But Sarah has passed on now. And he, now Abraham, it says here, he's old, he's well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, so this is a very trusted man of Abraham. This is, this is his most trusted man. Obviously, he has his son, but this guy is in charge of all his business, all of his goods, and everything that he has. He trusts this guy with, with all that he owns. And he says, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell." But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? So he's saying, you know, I need you to swear unto me. I want you to go out and, and get a, a woman out of, you know, one of the daughters of my relatives, of my kin. And, and you know, ask them to, to, if there's a woman that's willing to come and be my son's wife, but I don't want you, because I don't want any of these, these daughters of Canaan to be his wife, and I also don't want him to go back to where he came from, because God had called them out of that land. God had, had told them, you know, we wa I want you to come, and, and you're going to go to a land of which I'm going to tell thee of, and it required a lot of faith, but he also didn't want him going back into that land. So it was even more important than him finding the wife. He says, well, I don't want him going back into that land. He needs to stay here. This is where God has us. This is where God wants us to be. And look at verse number 7. The Bible says, The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. So he's bringing up the promise, saying, The God, that, you know, the very God that gave me this promise, that I'm going to inherit this land, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife, unto my son from thence. And we see so many things in Abraham's life of what great faith he had. And that's why he's recognized in, in, the, in the faith chapter in Hebrews. But um, for one, God tells him to go into a land. He doesn't know anything about it. And he says, well, I'll just tell you when you get there, basically. And, and Abraham had the faith to go out into this country. And then we saw with his faith with Isaac. When he says, okay, you know, the, the son of promise, he finally has this son in his old age, when he's like 100 years old, he has, he has Isaac. And then as he gets a little bit older, what does God do? He asks him, okay, now I want you to sacrifice your son. Your only begotten son is, I, I want you to sacrifice your son. But faithful Abraham, listen to what God had to say, and he, said, and he did not withhold even his own son. And we went over that in the previous chapters why he did that because he knew God's promise. He knew that God can't go back on his word. He knew that God was capable even to raise up his son from the dead. And basically he was thinking that he was going to reenact, do an enactment of the gospel of, of Jesus Christ, the Savior that was going to come and, um, and bring us salvation. But those are two very, very major 
places that were, where Abraham demonstrates his faith. But now we see even here, he's saying, look, I want you to go do this, but don't worry. God's going to send his angel before you. God's going to bring you and, and make sure that he prospers your way. And he's confident of this. He's telling his, you know, his servants kind of questioning and wondering, well, wait a minute, what happens when I get there? What happens, what happens if they won't give me a wife? What happens if, it, you know, if this doesn't quite work out? You know, you're asking me to promise to you, but what, what happens if it doesn't work? He says, don't worry about it. God's going to send his angel and he's going to make sure everything's going to work out. Now look at what it says in verse 8, he, but he gives them the caveat. He says, and if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath, only bring not my son thither again. So he's saying, look, God's going to lead you to the right person. God's going to prosper your way. He's going to make sure that, that you get to where you need to be. But of course, we all have free will, even though this is someone who has, who has been appointed by God for to be Isaac's wife, and we'll see that here. And actually, just jump down real quick to uh, to verse fourteen, because I want you to see this that that um, the prayer that that when God or when the, the servant is in the land, in verse fourteen he says, "And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee that I may drink, and she shall say." drink and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou, he's talking to God, that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. And of course, the very thing that he was praying and asking for God to do for him completely came to pass, showing that this is the person, Rebecca's the one, that God has appointed for Isaac to marry. Now, that was God's will. But Rebecca still has her own will to determine, is she going to go and do this? Is she going to go and be Isaac's wife? So, and Abraham knows this, and that's why he says, look, if she's not willing, if she's not willing to come, then you're cleared of your oath. You know, you, you don't have to do anything more, but I need you to go and do this for me. He's saying that's the only way you're going to be clear of this. Now, I also want to point out here because people have a, a common misconception of how fundamentalists will view women. And they'll say, and they'll say, you know, the Old Testament, you know, women were basically like slaves, and you want to bring us back to these dark ages and, and all this other nonsense. And what I want to point out first is that, you know, women were not thought of as slaves by Christians, by people who believed the Lord and the Bible. That is not how they are portrayed at all, which is why. You know, Abraham's even stating here, well, if she's willing, right, if, you know, if this isn't a, well, you're going to go purchase a wife for my son, and she's just going to be his wife, and that's the end of the matter. Because that's the, the, the image that a lot of people will have you believe these days of how things were in the Old Testament, that there's just all these arranged marriages, and that women didn't really have a choice in anything, they didn't have any rights, no one respected them, they were second-class citizens, that's false. It's false. Now, look, there are a lot of things that the world completely disagrees with that the Bible says is a, what a godly woman should be like and that the father, the, the husband is the head of the household and that God has put the man in charge and in authority in the decision making in the house and that the wives are supposed to submit to their husbands. That is true. But that does not make them any less valuable or less of a person or second-class citizens or anything. It's the structure that God has ordained because you can't have two people that have an equal voice in making a decision in a family. You just can't have it because what happens when you disagree? What do you defer to? If you are exactly even on, on being able to make a decision, let's say you know one person wants to, to move and the other person doesn't. or what? I mean, there's, there's major decisions that you make in life in general with a family. And the Bible prescribes that there is one person that it comes down to that has that authority to make those decisions. And it's the, it's the man, it's the husband that God has put in charge of that. And, you know, today's world, they don't like to hear that. And, and they'll, they'll call you the Taliban, they'll call you all kinds of things. But, um, but it, it's the Bible, folks. And, it, and, you know, we need to understand what is true and what's not true from the Bible. So we see here, women do have a will. They have a choice in the matter. And they always have, at least from people who respect God's word and, and what God has to say for us. Obviously, there's people who do all kinds of wicked things and evil things and where you know, slavery and everything else has happened, where, where people do purchase wives and everything else. But that's not God's plan and that's not what the Bible says that we should be doing. So here, women were not thought of as slaves. Rebecca was not thought of as a slave. She had the free will 
among God's people. Now, um, this is also proven in num turn to keep your finger here. We're going we're to continue staying in Genesis, but look at Numbers chapter 36. We'll see this again, the same concept of, of women being able to have their free will to determine who they want to marry. Numbers 36, verse 6, this is, this is a further explanation of what is to be done with the daughters of Zelophehad. Now, if you're not familiar with Zelophehad, Zelophehad was a man of, in Israel who had five daughters. And I'm on my way to being like Zelophehad. I've got three right now. But he had five daughters. And the, the problem that came up was that they dealt with inheritance and with the land that was given to them. And it was kind of a big deal. So um, the, the male children were the ones who inherited their father's land in that area. So, um, and, and it makes sense. You know, you can't, you can't have men and women both inheriting the land because when they get married, then you, then you have all kinds of confusion going on. So it was always be, would be passed on to the male child and they would continue the father's line and that lineage. Well, this man had all daughters and he didn't have a son that would carry on his name and in their inheritance. So they're saying, well, what should we do with the inheritance? What should we do with this land? Because this guy's name is basically going to, you know, his inheritance is going to go away and it's going to be distributed then to other people. And they didn't think it was right. So they, they came up with this solution in verse number six of Numbers 36. It says, this is the thing which the Lord doth command concerning the daughters of Zelophehad, saying, let them marry to whom they think best. Only to the family of the tribe of their father shall they marry. So they're saying they have free will to marry anyone they want, but the one caveat that they're putting on that is, well, it's got to be someone from within their tribe, within, the, within that same tribe of their father. That way the inheritance isn't going to another tribe. It's not screwing that up. But basically, hey, they could marry, it says here, whom they think best. It's not an arranged marriage. It's not, it's not something that's figured out. Say, you know what? They have the freedom. They have the free will to just to choose out who they think is best. It's the same thing that we have in the New Testament. Um, let me jump around my notes a little bit out of order. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you don't have to turn. Turn if you would to, um, to Deuteronomy chapter 7. I'm going to show you a few more examples from the Old Testament and, and some truths that are taught about basically how we need to find the right wife or find the right spouse. But we're, what we're going to notice here is a lot, of, a lot of scripture in the Old Testament that can give us some good knowledge and some good teaching on this subject. Now, obviously, we are not physically of the nation of Israel and, and that, that whole, the inheritance and, and, and keeping the tribes together and stuff, that's not in effect anymore today. That's, that's been done away with. So, but the concepts are still the same of being able to marry whom you think best. And in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 7, 39, the Bible says, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. So it's saying she has the free will. She could, do, she could marry whoever she wants, but it has to be it's only in the Lord, meaning that you know, they need to marry someone who else who's saved, someone else who's a believer in God, a believer in Jesus Christ. And that's the first thing. If you're, if you're unmarried, if you're going to be looking for a spouse one day, especially children, younger children, older children, you know, when you're looking for a spouse, you, the very first thing that's, that's a deal breaker is if someone's not saved. That should not be an option for you to marry. The Bible says here, which is, which is one of the reasons why Abraham was making such a big deal about sending his servant back to go find someone for Isaac to marry because the, the land that they were in, the land of the Canaanites, was a wicked heathen land. There were people there, they didn't believe the Lord. They didn't believe in God. And that's why eventually they're going to get so bad to the point to where God's going to just wipe them out and destroy them when he leads the children of Israel out of Egypt by the hand of Moses and gives them that inheritance that was promised unto Abraham. But Abraham's looking at these people. He's like, these people, they're worldly. They're of the world. They're of the, they, they worship false gods. They don't worship the Lord. I don't want my son to marry a woman that is not a believer, that does not believe on the Lord. And we ought to do the same thing today. And, and the First Corinthians says the same exact thing. Only in the Lord. Hey, marry who you want, but make sure that they're saved. That is, that is a, a key requirement. 
Now we saw already how Abraham's servant was praying that God would, would say, you know, he's like, lead me to the woman that you've chosen for Isaac to be married. And that's something that we should all be starting with in, in, in a pursuit for a spouse. is just praying to God, you know, lead me to the right woman. Lead me to a good woman. Lead me to a good husband. Lead me to a good man. Someone who's going to take care of me. You know, someone who loves you. Someone who's going to serve you with their life. Dear God, help me to find that person. That is the first place to start is to go to God with that type of a prayer. We saw that example here. And of course, God prospered. God, God listens and answers our prayer. This is how you ought to be starting for that. But let's look at some more of God's words to help us understand what we should be looking for in a spouse. You're in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Let's look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Girgashites, and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations, greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, Thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Look at this, verse 3. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shalt, thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. What he's saying here is, you know, you cannot go and marry one of the, the, the daughters of the heathen land because they're going to turn your heart away from God. And he's, you know, but you might be thinking, yeah, but I really love this girl. I mean, she's great. We have, we have a good time together. I feel, you know, my heart just feels so great while we're together. This man or this girl, you know, and, and you're thinking, but, you know, it'll be okay. And you think, you know, I'm a good, I'm a good Christian. I'm a good godly person. Maybe, maybe she'll see how good I am. And one day then she'll ultimately getting saved sometime after we get married. Don't have that type of an ad. Don't count on it. Because the Bible's saying here that they're going to turn your heart away from serving the Lord. You're, you're, they're going to stray you away. It's a lot easier for, for a person to be brought down into sin than it is to bring someone up out of sin. And here's the thing. We need to, you know, if you're interested in someone, you like them, okay, don't, but don't get married, definitely, until they get saved. And I would even say this. Don't let yourself get too attached to someone that's not saved. You don't even want to start going down that road and be tempted with, with saying, well, but I love her so much, I'm just going to get married anyways, even though I know it's not right. Mm -hmm. Keep that guard up. I mean, you want to go out with someone and, and get to know them, hey, first thing you should be doing is, is going over the gospel of Jesus. If they're saved, great. Now you can continue establishing a relationship. But if they're not, I would just be focusing on that before you really get closer to that person if it's someone that you think might be a prospect as a future spouse. The Bible says they'll turn your heart away. And this actually happened. You don't have to turn there, but in Judges, I'll read from you because this is exactly what happens. God's word is said. He gives them the warning. He says, look, they're going to turn your heart away. Don't take them. their daughters to be your wives. But what do they do? They ended up, they, first they didn't wipe them all out like they were supposed to. God's plan was, you know, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, they need to be removed because they were extremely wicked because they did all of the things that God made laws against. When you look at Leviticus 18 and 19 and 20 and you start looking at some of the really bizarre, perverted things that, that God had to make laws against as if we shouldn't have known that already, God still spells it out and says, look, if a man lies with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death. God says that's perversion and wickedness and abomination. He shouldn't even have to tell us that, but he's like, this is how I feel about it. It's sick. But all the people of that land that came before, that they, were, that they were brought into that land, the land of the Canaanites, they did all of those things. And it didn't even stop with the homosexuality. It went into animals and all kinds of weird stuff. All kinds of weird stuff. So that's why God said, look, 
they, they've crossed way over because God's a merciful, long-suffering God. Even to the heathen people, you know, he'll give them chance and opportunities. But it got to the point they were so bad and so wicked where God just said, look, we just gotta, they just got to be wiped out. The judgment is finally coming. They pushed it too far. And that has come on every nation where people have just pushed it too far. Even the nation of Israel, when, when they've gone and just started serving other gods, you know, God sends them prophets. He sends them prophets. He's saying, look, follow me. Get back to serving me. But if they just are stiff-necked and don't obey, he brings his judgment. And another nation will come in. They carry them captive. And this is the way that God operates. So they were supposed to have wiped out all those nations, but they didn't do it. They didn't completely obey God in that regard, so they still hung around. They were still living among them when they shouldn't have been, and they ended up marrying their wives. And in Judges 3, verse 5, the Bible reads, And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, Hittites, and Amorites, and Perizzites, and Hivites, and Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their daughters to their sons, and served their gods. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and forgot the Lord their God, and served Balaam in the groves. Mm -hmm. This is what happens. The finding the right spouse, a husband or a wife, is extremely important. Make sure that you find someone that is saved, someone that already is a believer. Because if you don't, if you marry someone else, they are going to turn you. You may not think so. You may think, I am solid. I am founded in the faith. I am a strong Christian. That will not happen to me. God says, you know what? Over time, it'll happen. They will turn your heart away to serving other gods. It happened to Solomon. I mean, you have to talk about someone who was wise. I mean, he was more wise than anybody. He, God gave him more wisdom than anyone that was before him and anyone that's come after him. He was, he was given riches, he was given all kinds of things. God has blessed him. He started off his life great, looking to God for everything and just, just being real humble. But what happened? He married a lot, a lot, <laughs> a lot of strange wives. He had you know, 700 wives and 300 concubines, a thousand women that he, that he was involved in, and most of them were these heathen women. And the Bible says that at the end of his life, these women turned his heart away from serving the Lord, and he was actually built a... He was, God spoke to, to Solomon, literally spoke to him audibly. And he was able to hear God speak to him and grant him his prayer and give him all of this wisdom. He grew up from David, his father, learning this stuff, yet he should have been founded and grounded, but he had these women that turned his heart away to the point where he even built altars unto these false gods. That's what, what will happen, and God has warned us that that will happen, and he is a perfect example of that. Now, turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter 5. I already read that verse from 1 Corinthians 7 that says, um, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord, only, you know, only someone who's saved. But... Um, that first part of that verse says that the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. That's why when you get married, usually you, you exchange vows, and the vow is until death do us part. You are binding yourself basically in like a legal and a lawful contract in God's eyes to be married and joined to that person until one of you dies. And we live in a society today that treats marriage as if it's like, just the next step up from dating. But it's not something that's holy or, or that's sanctified or something that really deserves the respect that it deserves. People today just kind of think of it as, well, I'm getting sick of my spouse. I'm just going to divorce them. Just divorcing them for any reason. Well, that's not the way that the Bible says. And look, you ought to love your... You, ought, you need to know in advance that you are making this vow and that, that this vow means something. And not only should it mean something to you, but it definitely means something to God. Because you are binding yourself before God to say, hey, look, until death we part. He said, that's it. And God says, God takes what you say seriously. When you make a vow, he'll hold you to that. To so where, look at what Jesus Christ says in Matthew 5. Look at verse 31. Jesus says, it hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, 
causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. This is not commonly preached, unfortunately, today as much as it should be. Because we have a lot of Christians even that are ignorant of this fact. Jesus Christ is saying, look, if there's someone that you know, and there are a lot of people these days that are divorced. A lot of people, they go out, they get married, they get divorced, whatever. They, they make mistakes in their life. But if you are a Christian and you are trying to find the right person to marry, do not marry someone that's divorced if their ex-spouse is still alive. The Bible says, Whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. In God's eyes, marrying someone who is divorced is the same thing as committing adultery. And adultery is an extremely wicked sin that was actually punishable by the death penalty in the Old Testament. That was something that God said, if, if a person commits adultery, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. It, I mean, that's serious. And again, today you'll see it on Hollywood, on the TV, on the, you know, on the sitcoms, on the movies, everywhere you go. These days, it's, it's pumped and promoted as being normal. Oh yeah, people, you know, people are having affairs and they're getting divorced and they're getting remarried and everything else as if, well, whatever, that didn't work out. No big deal. I'll move on to the next one. That's not the way that God has it in the Bible. Jesus said, if you marry someone that's divorced, you're committing adultery. And he puts in here, there's one caveat for divorce. And look, people think that like you get divorced for all these different kinds of reasons and it's justifiable. There is one reason that God ever allowed for divorce. And turn, if you would, to Matthew 19 while I go over this. Matthew chapter 19. There is one reason for divorce and it says in this verse that we just read, whosoever shall put away his, his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. Now, it uses the word fornication and adultery in the same verse. Now, fornication is not the same as adultery. Adultery is the term that's used. It's the same act. The same thing that happens between a man and a woman. Adultery is what it's called when someone's married. Fornication is what it's called when you are not married. This is something, that's, that's the act that you have with, a, with another you know, um, man or woman that before you ever exchange vows or anything like that. And that's wicked too. But that is not the same as adultery. Adultery carried the death sentence. Fornication did not. They are both wicked sins. But what he says here was saving for the cause of fornication. Fornication was the reason that you can get divorced from somebody. He didn't say adultery. And I'll get into the, I'll get into it right now. If you remember... Joseph, when Joseph and Mary, Joseph found out that Mary was with child, okay, before they consummated the marriage, they were espoused to each other, they were married, but they hadn't consummated the marriage yet. He hadn't fulfilled that yet. So when he found out that she was with child, the Bible says that Joseph, being a just man, thought to put her away privily. Meaning, he, he, kind of, he didn't want to make a big public example of her, but he's, he was a just man. He knew God's law. And he was saying, whoa, you know, th there's only one way that people become pregnant. So if she's with child, you know, she, commit, she had commit fornication. I'm, I want to back out of this marriage. Because I thought she was pure. I thought she was virgin. And that is the situation that God has designed to allow for divorce. But once that marriage is consummated, once you've fully come together and fulfilled that, that, that part of the marriage, that's it. And that's when the, the fornication turns into adultery and it's no longer fornication. Look at uh, Matthew 19, verse number 3. The Bible says, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And this is what the people today think. You know, it's lawful for a man to put his way his wife for every cause. It doesn't really matter. Anything that you come up with as a reason, go ahead and divorce her. And they were tempting him. That means they were testing Jesus Christ with, with this question. Look at his answer. I love his answer. Verse 4. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. 
Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. He's saying, look, God's plan is zero divorce. He says, I, what God's joined, God's joined you together. Don't let, don't split that up. You've become one flesh. You've become one person when you take your wife and you're married unto your wife. That, he says, what well, God's joined you together, don't, don't let any man put that asunder. Verse number 7 says, they say unto him, but now they question him about the law. Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. So he says the same exact thing here that he said in Matthew chapter 5. But he's saying, look, the hardness of your heart. God knew that some of you would just not be able to handle the fact, because you have a hard heart, that, that your spouse had commit sin, that your wife had commit sin, the sin of fornication prior to, you know, prior to you coming together, you found her not to be a maid, you found her not to be a, a, a virgin, and because of the hardness of your heart, God had made that one allowance. He said, but from the beginning, that was not so, and that, was not, that is not what God has intended. Um, and then they go on in that chapter and say, well, if, if the matter be such, it's not good for a man to have, you know, they're saying, whoa, like, wait a minute. You mean that we can't get divorced for, for any reason? Then, then maybe we need to rethink this thing. Then it, then it might not be a good thing. And look, take it seriously. Take the marriage that seriously because that's how God sees it. He says, look, there is one case. And these days, that case is going to be very hard to find, to even be fulfilled as, as allowable uh, of, a, of a reason. Because I don't believe that even adultery is a reason for divorce. And the reason why I believe that wasn't the case before is because adultery carried a death sentence. Sit up, sit still. Adultery carried the death sentence. So you wouldn't have to worry about divorcing someone who had betrayed you to the point where they, they had... They had um, you know, cheated on you and committed adultery. But, um, but that's the way it was. And, and I think today that we need to have the attitude, whether you're a husband or a wife or what you're thinking about this, that I am going to stick with, because that's why, you know, when you make your vows, it's for better and for worse. They don't add the for worse in there for no reason. Because when you're married to someone, it's not all sunshine and roses and, and, and rainbows 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's a commitment. And that's why you're vowing. Now look, there are lots of great times. Obviously, you love, you love your spouse. That's why you're getting married. You know, you go well together. You, you know, you love each other and you have lots of great times. But with that commitment, with that, you know, joining yourselves together, there's struggles and there's hard times and there's fights and there's other things that go on. But you both have to have the mentality of, you know, divorce is never an option. I'm never going to leave you. And, and Ephesians 5 really gives a good explanation of this because it likens our marriage as Jesus Christ in the church. And you think about your own salvation. Now, Jesus Christ said he's never going to leave you or forsake you. No matter how many times we screw up, we sin, we do what's wrong, we make God upset, we, you know, we can do all kinds of different things, yet we know we know and we can count on it that God is faithful and God is true and God will never turn his back on you. Even if you were to turn his back on him, God will not turn his back on you. That is the picture that we present in our marriage. That's what we should be presenting is that with your spouse, you have to have that mindset, I will never forsake my wife. Even if I, I, I've already a long time ago come to this conclusion, if my wife were ever to do anything so wicked that, that, that I don't even want to talk about, if she were ever to do anything like that, I already know right now I will not divorce her. I will not because I've made that promise and I'm going to stick to my word. And that, that will not happen. And having that mindset, I'll tell you this, having that mindset is important for your marriage. Because when you realize that and know that and believe that and say nothing will ever separate us, you have to find ways to make things work. You, you, you're gonna, you know, it, it's going to move you. You don't have an out. You don't have another option of just saying, well, I'm just going to leave them. That's removed. So you have to figure out a way to make things work when things do become difficult. And it's that mindset will help you and help your marriage 
to, to have a, a long and blessed marriage. Let's go back to um, Genesis chapter 24. There's a few more things I want to point out here. You know, deciding who you want to marry is a big deal. And these, these um, principles that we've read from the Bible, it doesn't matter if they're Old Testament or New Testament, they still stand. You still need to find someone who's godly and righteous, someone who wants to serve the Lord. And, um, you know, divorce should never be an option. And don't look for someone. If, if you find out that someone has previously been married, you know, that should be off the table as an option for someone to, to get married to. And it's getting harder and harder these days. I understand that. But, but as hard as it may be, hey, pray to God. And as, speaking of the prayer, like the servant, I love how, how God answers his prayers. Well, look at verse 15 of Genesis 24. Hopefully you caught this when we were reading the chapter. Verse number 15 says, And it came to pass, before he had done speaking... That behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. So the servants, they're praying to God and saying, you know, God, you know, please, you know, the person, that, that the woman that comes out here, and, and I tell her I'm thirsty, and she gives me a drink, and then she waters the camels, everything else. While he's praying this, before he's even done praying, God's answering his prayer. If the words aren't even completed coming out of his mouth, and God's just like, here you go. Here's Rebekah. And um, this reminded me of, of Daniel. And in Daniel, turn if you would to... Uh, yeah, turn if you would to Daniel 9. Daniel chapter 9. I've got quite a few verses here. But Daniel, basically the same thing happens. Daniel got a lot of, of uh, prophecy given to him. A lot of end times events. A lot, a lot of dark sayings. A lot of things that, that aren't necessarily easily understood, especially for where they were at that time of history and the amount of God's word that had been revealed up to that point. And we see here, um, you know, Daniel's a very righteous man, a very humble man, and he knows the Bible real well. And we see here in Daniel 9, look at verse number 2. It says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So Dan, what he's saying here is that, you know, I, I, I understood that the children of Israel were going to be held captive for 70 years. Um, Daniel at this time, it's under the Babylonian reign. They've been taken captive out of Israel. And he starts to see and understand, oh, Jeremiah the prophet prophesied this, that it was, only, that it was going to be lasting for 70 years. And Daniel understands this now. By, it says, by books, the number of years. He gets it. Verse 3, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting in sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him, to them that keep his commandments. So here, he's starting to pray. We're not going to read through the whole prayer, but he goes, he continues on and on with his supplication and his confessions to God. Jump down to verse number 20. The Bible says, And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee. For thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision." He says at the beginning, the, 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 the angel Gabriel says, the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth. God sent me out as soon as you started talking. This is why prayer is so important in our lives. And we need to understand how real this is. You know, oftentimes, and I know myself included, prayer seems to, to take a back seat sometimes. But it ought not. 
We need to, to know and realize and understand God is a God that answers prayer. We see it all throughout the Bible time and time again. Look, God is just waiting for you. Just waiting for you to ask Him. That's why the Bible says in Matthew 7, Ask and it shall be given you. This is Jesus Christ making you a promise. Saying, Look, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And he likens it unto a, a, a father and a son. He says, Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? So he's saying, look, you know, if, you're, like, if my daughter comes up to me and says, hey, I'm hungry, can I have a fish? And I'm going to just like give her a snake? Like, is it going to bite her? Like, no, of course not. You know, he's saying, look, you being evil, you know how to give good gifts unto your children. Well, if you're born again, you're God's child. If your faith is in Jesus Christ, you are God. God is your father and you are his child. We ought to keep that in mind and say, God, well, when we have needs, God, help me out with this. God, please give me, you know, the things that I need. Now, it doesn't mean go and say, God, help me win the lottery so I can just have a whole bunch of money and just blow it on vanity. No, because... If my daughters just came to me and just said, hey, I just want to have like, you know, $10,000. Dad, come on. Live a little. Let's just, I just want to go out and have some fun. I'm not going to give them that either. Okay? But when you're asking for, for good things and right things, hey, you, you need food. Go to God. Ask Him for stuff. You need, you know, you're, you're having health problems. Go to God. Ask Him for help. Ask, go, go straight to God. Hey, you're looking for a spouse. Go to God and ask Him. And with these people, what He did, these righteous people, people who loved God, the words weren't even finished coming out of their mouth and God was answering their prayers immediately. It's reality. That's why James 5 says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The effectual fervent prayer. Be serious about your prayer life. But not just that. It says of a righteous man. You want God to be listening to you? Show him that you know how to listen to him and listen to his words and, and start living a righteous life and doing what is right in his eyes. And he sees, oh, wow, he's listening to what I have to say. I'll listen to him. I'll open up my ears. And, and, and that's exactly what he does. Ask and you shall receive. That's why, I, I, you know, that's why we even have the prayer list, the prayer request that we have for you to take home don't just toss that to the side. Prayer is extremely important and it ought to be a big part of our life. God is a God. Our God is a God that answers prayers. And that is a wonderful thing. Let's get back to, the, to, the sto to Genesis 24 again. Um, I'm almost done. There's just like one or two more points I want to make before we're done with this chapter. The big thing that we saw here was the, the amount of effort that was put into um, finding a wife for Isaac and the right kind of wife. But we see here also that, you know, the servant's prayer was answered immediately. And then um, I just want to point out something more now about the character of Rebecca and how she was a godly woman. And one thing, you know, when, when, the, when the servant came unto her and asked just for some water, look what the Bible says. It says in... Um, Verse 17, And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. Look at this. And she hasted. It means she moved quickly. She wasn't dawdling. She wasn't, you know, just, Oh, I guess so. Oh, you're thirsty? Here, here's a little water. Fine. Now I'm going to have to go back and get more. Thanks a lot. Now I've got more work to do. No. She hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also. She's just offering this now. She's being very hospitable, very friendly, very courteous, very nice to some stranger. He was a stranger. He came in. Is Abraham some servant? He had these camels and all, he asked for some water. And look at how she treats him. 
with respect and and she must be humble in order to to be able to say oh let me you know, I'll do this for you let me do that for you I'll draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking and she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and look did she walk did she kind of dawdle over no and ran again unto the well to draw water and drew for all his camels she's a righteous woman this is a, this is an attitude I wish that you know, more of us ought to have instead of having this 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 attitude of Oh man, you know, I gotta help this person too. <sighs> Fine, I get like it, like it's this big deal, you know. I I was gonna go, you know, I'm trying to get back home because I've got like ten other things to do, and now you need a drink of water. That's the attitude most people have today. You know, I'm I'm too busy. I've got too many things going on. I I I I've got all. You don't understand. I'm super busy. I can't. I don't have time to help you out. I can't afford to help you out. I've got three children, one away. I, don't have, I, can't, I can't help you. I can't do anything about that. No. No, that's not what God has called us to do. We ought to be hasting to help people out. We ought to have that level of hospitality. And we went over that Abraham is such a great example of a Christian and of a person. And um, I think that his servant learned a lot from being with Abraham and being a servant in his household for so long. We've, I've already demonstrated in the past how his servants respected Abraham enough to be able to go out to battle when Lot was taken captive, when, uh, when the kings had defeated the, the, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and, uh, and all those other lands, and they took Lot captive. Abraham took his household and the servants that were brought up in his house, and they all followed him against, uh, to fight a battle against like f uh, four kings or five kings that had already defeated all these other kings. It was an uphill battle. It was not, the odds were not in their favor to win this fight. But they respected him and trusted him enough to go and follow him, to go and save Lot and, and bring him back. And we see here, you know, that Rebecca has a similar type of an attitude where she meets his ser Abraham's servant and she is willing to just hastily help him and to give him what he needs. And then um, the last point I'm going to make and this chapter is, is found all the way at the end because here's another thing that people don't get. And I've mentioned this. This is a repetitive theme, but I'm going to preach it again. Is the idea of children being a blessing and not a curse, not something. You know, these days when someone says they're pregnant, it's kind of like you don't know what to say. Like, uh, should I be happy for you? Is that you know? And that's because you have so many people these days that are just committing fornication and committing adultery, and they're not getting married, not doing things the right way. Having children is a joyous event. It's a good thing. The Bible says, "Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them." I'm talking about um, children of the youth, children that that you have. Um, even when you're young, you know, people are always telling you, well, get married and then go to college or finish college and then go vacation and go do this and go do that and then have kids. No. Children are a blessing. Children are a heritage of the Lord. Children are a blessing. I, I, we, I have the philosophy, you know, the more the merrier, the more I have, then the more God is blessing me. Because children truly are a blessing from God. The Bible says that God's the one that opens up the womb and God's the one that closes the womb. We shouldn't be taking those matters into our own hands. And look at the blessing that they gave Rebecca as they were sending her off on her way to go and become Isaac's wife. This is what they tell her. This is the best blessing that they could think to give her. It's in verse number 60, right near the end. It says, And they blessed Rebecca and said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. Obviously, this isn't talking just in her one generation. It's talking that she has a lot of children, but then that, and that her children become a great nation, a mighty nation. But the, the blessing still stands of her being a mother. Her being a mother to many children and that, and that her seed and her lineage and that would all grow and they could have a really big family is a very good thing. Thousands of millions. That's billions. That's a, that's a, lot, that's a lot of people. And that, that's considered a blessing. Now it's considered a curse. Now you're saying, you know, now people will be saying, you know, my wife gets it all the time. Oh, what? You, you just try and have your boy now? Oh, you know, are, are you going to stop? You know, these comments as if 
our children are like a bad thing. And, you know, I don't understand that type of perspective. I love every single one of my children. I'm always excited to meet the next one. And I think it's great. And the Bible says that they're a blessing. Now, I think what a lot of people have this bad attitude is because they're not raising their children appropriately and they're not using the proper discipline that the Bible says that we should use. You know, the Bible says, He that, ha that, that spareth the rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him chasteneth him behind the times. So that's why you see these kids growing up into monsters that are throwing, you know, throwing themselves down and in Walmart and you know having these screaming and kicking fits and, and just you know these parents just going, oh I can't take it anymore. It's because you're not disciplining them appropriately. You're not raising them right. You're letting them become monsters. But when you don't allow them to become monsters, children are a huge blessing. They're great. You love them. I mean, we get, you know, and again, this isn't, this isn't the two by own horn, but it's just the society and the day that we live in that used to be the norm when people knew how to raise their family. But it's like we can't barely even go out now before people are saying, oh, wow, your children are so well behaved. It's like they're, they're you know, they're, they're normal, I think. They act up sometimes, sometimes they don't, but in general, I mean, they're able to sit down, but it doesn't happen by chance. This <laughs> isn't something that's just like, wow, you're just so lucky that they happen to be sitting there. No, it takes work, it takes effort, and it takes teaching and training. And, you know, when you view children as being a great blessing, kind of like the way you view your marriage, you know, as, as being a good thing, as being a great thing, you're going to do a lot for it. When you view your children as a blessing, you're going to invest your time in them. You're going you're gonna to take the time involved to teach them and train them. And even and if it requires disciplining, if it requires a spanking, not being so lazy as to just ignoring it and just saying, I don't want to deal with that. And just let them to continue to get away with stuff that they shouldn't be getting away with. No, they need to be taught. They need to be trained. And, and it is a lot of work. But it brings a lot of joy. And a lot of blessing. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for my children, dear God. I thank you for these great truths that we can learn from the Bible, Lord. I pray that you would please help. I know especially with my children and with, with everyone here that's not married, dear God, help them not to, to make mistakes. Help them to learn and to gain the wisdom from your words in advance because there's so many people making so many mistakes these days on this, on this topic and, and with their lives, dear Lord that you would um, help everyone to, to remember that you know, people need to be saved and that divorce is not an option, dear God. And I pray that you would please just, just help everyone that's single here eventually when their time comes to find a, a godly spouse, dear Lord, that's going to complement their life and that will um, be, be a good godly person, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just help us to Remain steadfast in our faith regardless of how the world views things or what's politically correct or popular these days. Dear Lord, shouldn't matter to us at all. We should stand on the truths of the Bible, dear God, and not be swayed from, from following them or, or, or have the world silence us about what we believe. Dear Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.